Welcome to Imperial College in London. Uh, my name is James Kinross. I'm a senior lecturer in surgery and I have the pleasure of hosting the webinar today. Um, this is the second webinar in our series and um, we are very grateful for the positive feedback we've had over the last two that we've run. Uh, we know that you guys have a lot more questions and we uh, are keen to support you in answering those questions. So please do keep them coming to us as we structure the webinars going forward. Since we last spoke on Friday, um, there have been just under 2,500 new cases of COVID-19 in London, and there have now been 281 deaths. To put that into perspective, in Italy, there have now been 59,138 detected cases and 5,476 deaths. Since Friday, we've seen continued repositioning of the NHS's position, and I'm sure if you are like me, you have been extremely busy uh, trying to prepare your service for the coming days. Pansurge's mission is to rapidly collate, share, uh, and um, distribute best clinical practice. And the best way that we can do that now is to hear directly from clinicians managing this condition in Italy. Uh, and that's gonna be our job over the next hour. Uh, before we start, I want to say how grateful we are to Professor Carlo Antona, who unfortunately couldn't be with us today. He was due to speak. Uh, our thoughts are with him and his team, and we're very grateful for his offer, and we hope him. Uh, all the best in the future. Uh, we're extremely lucky to have three outstanding speakers. I think it's worth saying that um, um, the, the colleagues who are going to speak to you are speaking from extremely um, uh, uh, competent and important internationally recognized centers of excellence in Geneva and in uh, Milan. Uh, and uh, they are extremely experienced clinicians and uh, what they have to say, I'm sure you will find extremely valuable. So I'm very, very grateful to them. Uh, before I introduce them in turn, just to say that this session will last for one hour and one hour only. Uh, our speakers are extremely busy and we don't want to take up more of their time. This is your session, it's not ours, so there is a question function. Uh, please ask your questions. If you don't ask questions, you can't learn. Uh, I will try and answer and ask as many questions as I possibly can as you produce them. And I will try and stream them so that they make sense. Please forgive me if I uh, pronounce your name incorrectly. Um, I will initially ask each clinician just to give a brief overview of their experience in the hospital at the moment. I will have some kickoff questions and then we will go into yours. Um, and that's it really. So I'd like to just to initially start off by introducing uh, Professor Danelli, who is the head of the Department of Surgery at the Luigi Sacco Hospital in Milan, and also um, Dr. Andrea Mangini, who um, also works at the University of Milan, and then Dr. Lorenzo Ball, who's an ICU specialist at uh, the University uh, Hospital in Geneva. Um, so why don't we start with um, uh, Professor. Uh, Professor, may you be kind enough, please, just to explain to us the situation on the ground in uh, Milan today. I don't speak English very well, so I have uh, my uh, assistant who will speak uh, for me. Hello, I'm uh, Claudio Guerci, uh, resident in uh, general surgery, and uh, this is Professor Donnelly, uh, who uh, you uh, all know. Um, in Milan now, uh, hospitals are uh, working as uh, hubs, um, uh, which is uh, the, uh, to collect patients with the, uh, with the same disease. Uh, we have hubs for uh, infectious disease and hubs uh, for other um, pathologies. Uh, Sacco Hospital is the center for infectious uh, disease in uh, the, nor uh, the northern Italy. Uh, so, uh, for example, ambulances um, coming from the territory, um, bringing patients with surgical problems, um, are prevented to go to head to Sacco Hospital, um, which is uh, uh, the, um, the center for infectious disease. Uh, anyway, we have the possibility to perform elective surgical um, oncologic operations here. Uh, because I'm aware that, of course, um, Professor, you're head of department. How many, how many operations, elective operations, are you performing in your hospital at the moment? And what type of surgery are you performing? Okay. Uh, 13 sale. Mm -hmm alla settimana con una media di uh, 30 interventi. Okay. We have 13 um, 13 operating room uh, working in uh, uh, in a week uh, with um, at least uh, 
uh, a th 30 uh, surgical operation um, uh, at week. Are you able to continue to function with um, your multidisciplinary team meetings and uh, is the decision making functioning uh, as normal? C'è un, uh, uh, un capo che decide uh, che cosa operare e uh, i team multidisciplinari si compongono al momento. Okay. Uh, we have uh, a general uh, manager who decides uh, who has to uh, be operated or an, uh, um, a multidisciplinary um, on a multiple disciplinary basis and uh, um, a lot of disciplines um, could uh, find their face. On the questions that they were struggling to hear uh, you a little uh, on, the, on the computer, so hopefully we can correct that. Um, can you please give us some indication of how you are deciding to stratify treatment? So on what basis do you decide a patient is fit or suitable for surgery? Uh, sì, uh, prima uh, i pazienti oncologici che hanno uh, dei criteri di urgenza che sono stati divisi in tre tipi A, B, C dalla, uh, dalle linee guida del, fatte in collaborazione con Regione Lombardia a cui ho partecipato e, e successivamente i pazienti urgenti. Okay. Um, oncologic patients uh, who need uh, general surgery are divided into three groups um, which, are, uh, which are A, B or C. Um, respectively, uh, patients who need to be operated within two weeks and uh, uh, after two weeks uh, and within two months, and uh, uh, the third group, uh, group C, um, after two, uh, two months. Okay, and uh, um, there is the possibility uh, to uh, operate patients who need uh, intensive care after the operation, um, and these patients are. Um, uh, operate in a, a have the possibility to be operated in uh, other hubs. For us in the UK at the moment, ring fencing and protecting intensive care capacity for elective surgery is extremely contentious because we are in the early phase of the disease and yes. at the moment the concern is simply to manage our acutely unwell patients. I have lots of questions for you. I'm going to ask one more question and then I will bring in our other guests and then we will have a further questioning from the audience. A question that we get asked many times is about laparoscopy. Are you performing laparoscopic surgery? And if so, have you changed how you perform this? Okay. Uh, we are performing laparoscopic surgery, for example, uh, for a, a total uh, colectomy. Um, in a patient uh, with um, acute uh, uh, ulcerative colitis. And uh, we didn't change the uh, way to perform laparoscopy, uh, laparoscopic surgery, but we changed the, uh, the way to uh, prepare patients. For example, uh, before except this patient, we uh, performed uh, um, um, X-ray, thorax X-rays, and uh, uh, we tried to perform uh, uh, laboratory tests uh, for uh, COVID-19 virus. These uh, shortly. So thank you uh, so much, Professor. We will come back to you with more questions. Um, if I could please uh, um, bring in your uh, Dr. Ball now. So um, thank you for speaking to us from Geneva. Um, can you please also summarize what the situation is in uh, Geneva this evening, please? Hello to everyone. Thank you for inviting me to this talk. And uh, the situation in, in Geneva is, I would say that it's uh, rapidly uh, deteriorating. Uh, we are uh, a smaller region compared uh, to Lombardy, in which uh, Milano is. And uh, we started seeing uh, cases uh, a couple of weeks uh, later compared uh, to Lombardy. So we took some advantage in terms of uh, organization so we could uh, uh, prepare uh, some of our intensive care units uh, uh, to receive uh, uh, COVID patients. Um, 
but uh, we are witnessing uh, in the last uh, two or three days uh, a steep increase uh, of uh, both mild and severe cases. So uh, I cannot say any for our region because uh, really the, the situation is uh, rapidly changing, which is also probably the case of other regions. But in, in our case, uh, uh, it's, it's a, it has been a, a rapid uh, increase in the last days, also probably because of, our, uh, of the physical uh, proximity to Lombardy and the, the first uh, uh, cases uh, were observed uh, in Italy situation in the United Kingdom and many of the colleagues listening to this are listening from outside of London. London is obviously ha experiencing the first significant uh, number of cases and uh, I think we expect my colleagues outside of London to be a, a week or so behind us. Um, can you please give me an indication of how well uh, the local leadership is working and any important lessons you have learned in how you can organize your local leadership structure so that it is effective? Uh, well, uh, again, uh, we, our condition is rapidly evolving, but I would say that uh, the leadership, uh, at least from our side, I mean, in terms of the organization of the critical care beds and uh, the intermediate care units, uh, the leadership is very clear. There is a regional coordinator of the emergency, and I'm again talking about the, the critically ill patient side of the organization team. And uh, uh, the, the organization is reshaped, uh, I would say, daily based uh, on how many beds uh, are occupied and uh, how much the, the, the need of care is increasing both within our hospital and also within the network that coordinates the the ICUs of our of our region which is a small region it's one and a half million people around us how many beds intensive care beds you have in your hospital and how they are coping at the moment well i think it's even more interesting telling you how many beds we used to have because our our intensive unit um, our intensive care unit had uh, 24 beds which were first divided in covid plus uh, other 20 covid free uh, beds but we rapidly moved uh, uh, to another situation in which we expanded uh, in 30 beds only for COVID and then in less than one week we could open uh, 12 more beds uh, uh, in the former uh, operating theatre and uh, we are now increasing uh, a structure with 50 beds, 5 zero, uh, beds of uh, intermediate care and uh, intensive care uh, patients for non-invasive ventilation. And we moved all the non-COVID uh, critically ill patients to another division. Can you tell me what your, uh, what your strategy is for testing? And we are having a lot of questions about specific tests uh, and which patients that you're testing. Uh, also, in this case, the, the, the situation is, uh, is changing because at the beginning uh, we dealt with the epidemics in Italy as if we had a single uh, epidemic uh, site uh, in Lombardy and then we, we perceived the uh, patients at risk uh, as patients at risk or only those with direct uh, contacts uh, with people coming from that areas. And uh, we changed uh, this strategy because we started uh, uh, finding uh, several unexpected uh, uh, positivity cases, both symptomatic and non-symptomatic. We had issue both in managing patients that were already admitted for respiratory failure and that we discovered later on that they were positive and patients that were admitted for several other regions, mainly surgical reasons, that developed uh, respiratory failure during their hospital stay, both before and after surgery. And that's one major challenge. So uh, if you ask me some kind of suggestion, then that's what the WHO uh, says, do as many tests uh, as you can, which is easy to say and not that easy to do. So uh, it's not only about uh, ICUs and the critically ill beds, also the labs must be ready for uh, dealing for with a huge increase of the needs uh, of uh, people and uh, equipment uh, for testing.
it's in London is that we're trying to prepare for that and, and we are equally fine challenging. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Paul. I'm just going to use this moment to bring in uh, Dr. Mangini and to understand a little more of his experience. Thank you, Dr. Mangini. Could you? Thank could you. you thank you for a kind invitation. Oh um, no, obviously the pleasure is ours. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'm a cardiac surgeon, so uh, I'm a consultant cardiac surgeon. So it's my vision. It's a bit different from the others because we tried to organize our uh, surgery department in in our region in a very complex way uh, because our aim was to reduce as much as possible the intensive care uh, unit beds uh, uh, for the cardiac surgery department so um, we tried to uh, move all the patients uh, 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 post-operative patients in another region to free beds and uh, to uh, reorganize and to reallocate all the resources uh, what I'm trying to explain is that we uh, we follow the um, the uh, regional government guidelines to create an hub and spoke uh, uh, kind of organization in which uh, formerly we had 21 cardiac surgery division in uh, Regione Lombardia. Uh, nowadays, 17 uh, are closed, and there are only four uh, to uh, to operate the non-COVID patients. Um, in this way, we, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, more intensive care uh, unit beds, more ventilators, more nurses and more doctors to give to the COVID wards. Because our main problem is uh, to free the hospital to be able to, uh, um, to accept all the COVID patients that are coming in, in, the, in our hospitals. Um, this is not so easy to do. It's not, uh, we, we don't have uh, till now a very clear idea of how to do it, uh, but uh, luckily we, have, we had uh, quite clear guidelines from the local government, the regional government. Um, we uh, developed a system in which um, uh, every uh, hub has to organize its own guidelines and this is easy to manage, but not very easy for the future, because uh, we have, of course, to change the normal guidelines. Nowadays, it's impossible for us to operate an 80 years old man for an aortic dissection, for acute aortic dissection, because we don't have enough ICU beds for this kind of patient. So uh, we have created new guidelines for the moment. The problems that are uh, our own guidelines and this could be a, a legal problem in the future because our uh, what I, I can advise to you that uh, uh, your scientific society has absolutely to write new guidelines for the moment just to protect uh, all of you from possibly uh, future legal problems um, in any case uh, we written there are not uh, not anymore a lot of uh, cardiac uh, urgent procedure to be performed, uh, probably because uh, a lot of patients uh, uh, has fear to go to the, to the urgent department if they have uh, uh, pain or whatever. Uh, so they arrive in the hospital uh, in the very last moment, uh, very, very ill. So very often there is nothing to do and nothing to perform. Uh, another thing we are trying to organize is, a, is a, some BV ECMO uh, hospitals but the problem is that uh, we have so many patients that it's, we, it's probably it's stupid to, uh, to try to treat with uh, VV ECMO these patients because we don't have enough resources, not enough pump, enough, enough uh, nurses, enough doctors to follow all of them. Talking before we went live, I was asking you about scanning an x-ray and you said you couldn't do CTs because there's physical yeah. no space in the hospital. Could you try and give people listening in the UK a feeling of uh, the state of the hospital, the state of crowding and how easy it is to function there yeah. today? So um, in, uh, what I know very well, of course, is my hospital. My hospital in the last week is completely changed, uh, totally and completely changed. I just plug in my computer because it's going off the battery. Uh, it's completely changed. They are rebuilding all the walls. They are building new walls, uh, walls everywhere, just to create uh, COVID uh, zone and non-COVID zone. 
uh, but every time they, they build a new wall, uh, one day after we, you have to move that wall in another position because patients are coming and are coming in numbers that are unbelievable. Uh, because as you already know, it's not a problem of absolute numbers. The problem is that if you have a, um, the, the bell curve, uh, now it's like that. And we are trying with all the organization in moving the, the bell curve in, in, in this fashion. So to reduce the number of patients coming in the same day in any uh, uh, urgent department. Try and, yeah, and it's extremely difficult. To, of yeah. course, the, the best things would be to, to perform a CT scan to all patients because very often, this is very important, the CT scan is much uh, more accurate than the, the, the COVID test. We have a negative COVID test, but with a so clear CT scan that, of course, we and with symptoms, so of course, it's a COVID patient. And it's extremely difficult also from the legal point of view, try to define if you are, you are COVID negative, but you have all uh, the CT scan and the symptoms to be COVID, in which kind of world you have to go. You understand what I mean? So if, I mean, I, again, I'm going to finish this question with, I'm, I will finish this webinar with the same question for all of you, but I'm particularly interested in the fact that we have two weeks now to think about this. And so if you were thinking about this two weeks ago, how would you have set up your department differently uh, and what would you advise us? Well, I have to say, uh, stop immediately all the elective procedures because in the um, elective procedures who will need an ICU bed uh, postoperatively, because you really, uh, you, you will really need all the intensive care unit uh, beds that you can uh, afford, that you can create. Uh, as uh, Lorenzo told you before, we started with uh, a, a 10 beds in, in the um, general ICU, and eight beds in the uh, cardiac surgery ICU. Now we have uh, almost 50 intensive care unit beds. All the wards are becoming intensive care unit with ventilator and with uh, uh, all kinds of doctors trying to, uh, to manage these ventilators and these ventilated patients. And of course, you also need uh, some wards for uh, CPAP, so, so high pressure, uh, non-invasive um, ventilation. But the problem is uh, that um, this, these wards are much more dangerous than the ICU. So they have to be completely closed and with uh, negative pressure uh, systems. And of course, we have to rebuild the hospital. In fact, uh, we have negative pressure in intensive care and in all the infectious disease department, but not in the normal uh, internal medicine wards. And now they are trying to build as fast as possible all the negative pressure in all the hospitals. And another very important uh, issue was the, the flow of the oxygen. Our hospital was built to, to have a medium and average flow of oxygen because for the intensive care unit and for all the patients in the world. Now with the CPAP in which you increase to 50 liter per minute, 30 liter per minute, and we had a 50 patient on in, in this condition of course the the system is not uh, working well you don't have enough pressure in the oxygen lines pipes so they have to rebuild the oxygen pipes one uh, one advice i can give you try to to be ready to that to the oxygen i've certainly seen some evidence in the uk that that is obviously a strategic priority for the nhs um i i want to before we open up the floor to all of the questions and we're getting some great questions i'm going to go into all of these for you if you're listening um i just want to come back to the legal guidelines issue because i think this is very important and we are struggling with this as surgeons now because our our um the nhs is releasing some guidance on how we should triage patients to make decisions for example in cancer or cardiovascular disease but we have very little uh, we are hearing very little from associations and professional bodies and so i am interested in interested in how uh, as um local uh, groups you decided uh, 
on consensus for, for example, who should have surgery and who should not have surgery for um, severe, you know, aortic disease. How did you decide that? And what, into, what discussion have you had with these bodies to try and create some consensus about what is best practice? Yeah, the problem is that we, uh, we only manage this kind of uh, guidelines between us. I mean, every hub and spoke system created its own guidelines. And this is not a very uh, uh, intelligent thing, but unfortunately, our uh, society is not giving us uh, uh, guidelines for that moment, for that uh, topic. So, um, in uh, Arctic, we, we, we can't perform any more operation in uh, cardiac surgery procedure, sorry, in patients more than 80 years old. This was the first, uh, the first new guideline, but it it's something very strong, of course, because you have 80 in COVID ne negative. So you have a lot of very, uh, very good patients in uh, um, uh, more than 80 years old. But in any case, we can't operate anymore this kind of patient. And uh, we decided each um, pathology and we decided on our own the new guidelines. But this, as you can imagine, it's not an intelligent thing because, of course, uh, we are a, a part of the group. But we are not the entire group of cardiac surgery in Italy. And uh, so we are waiting. Uh, the uh, Italian Society for Cardiac Surgery or the European Society as well, because it would be better to have only one big society in trying to create new uh, temporary guidelines uh, for all the different pathology, because this could be to me, of uh, paramount importance for the future. Floor, and I'm going to bring back in your colleagues. So in terms of your cardiac surgery um, practice, in the patients that you have operated on, have you seen uh, any difference in the outcome uh, that you would expect? I mean, in COVID-negative patients? Mm. No. Yes. A co and positive, negative and positive. No, uh, till now, I, I didn't perform any COVID positive patients. Uh, as I told you before, uh, COVID patients that arrive in a, a severe form, mm. they are, it's not possible to operate them. They are too ill. The illness is too big to be, uh, to can support a cardiac surgery, cardiac surgery procedure. Um, and till now, we, we didn't perform in Milano a COVID uh, positive procedure, cardiac surgery procedure. Okay, that's extremely helpful. Thank you so much. Um, so I think what we'll do now is, can we bring back in um, some of your colleagues? Um, but Professor, may I start with you, please? We have this consistent question asked multiple times in the room about PPE. Can you please tell me the guidelines you have in your hospital for both elective PPE and for acute PPE. Does that does that make sense? Um, okay. Professor Danelli? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what uh, uh, PPE? For, for when for, for elective surgery, what do you recommend? For surgeons to wear, should they have full PPE for all cases, for negative cases, or uh... Mm. Um, uh, we have to consider that um, we uh, the most severe cases of um, acute respiratory syndrome uh, don't have uh, um, don't need uh, general surgery. We uh, we don't, we didn't see uh, such thing uh, uh, yet at Sacco Hospital at least. Uh, so, no COVID inpatient at Sacco Hospital need a surgical abdominal operation. Uh, in case of that, uh, we have uh, organized pathways, separate pathways, and separate elevators, and separate surgical teams for that. Um, for uh, as regards PPE, um, we uh, suggest to wear um, um, surgical masks like that um, for non-COVID patients. And uh, um, uh, conversely, uh, we suggest to use um, a, um, a PP, a FPPP, FPP2 or FPP3 
in uh, a COVID positive patient. Your colleagues have very kindly discussed this and you also mentioned this, but my, my question then is, how do you define who is COVID positive and negative? Do you base this on your respiratory PCR tests or do you base this on x-rays? Or Because we are having many patients who are asymptomatic uh, and have negative tests, but the CT shows that they have signs. Okay, uh, every patient who uh, comes to the hospital and needs a surgical or abdominal operation uh, are uh, tested uh, with um, um, laboratory tests and uh, um, a nasal uh, or pharyngeal uh, sample, uh, for example, and uh, uh, X-ray, thorax, thorax, uh, thoracic X-ray. Much. Um, can, you, can you can you tell us? So Michael uh, Nowakowski has asked us a question. How do you organize ward work? How many doctors are on call? And what do you do when patients arrive in the hospital and they have a suspected diagnosis? So I think we'll break that question in two. How are you managing your on-call rotors in your hospital? Okay. Okay, uh, we have uh, two surgeons on call, uh, ready for um, for operate, and uh, uh, one surgeon uh, on the place. Okay, for surgical uh, um, urgencies. Okay. And I asked this question of um, your colleagues who spoke to us on Friday. How is the morale of the team? Are, are, are people coping? Um, we have uh, separate teams. Um, we have to split out um, our um, surgical staff uh, in two uh, st different staff. Uh, one staff, uh, composed by one third of the total of surgical staff, uh, is dedicated totally dedicated to uh, COVID patients. Um, the other two thirds of the uh, original uh, surgical uh, staff um, are, are trying uh, is trying to. Um, perform surgical um, operations and uh, um, to try to manage the um, the ward uh, of uh, surgery ward and uh, the moral uh, is um, uh, it's not up uh, obviously uh, because uh, we are uh, more and more patients are coming to the hospital um, COVID patients and uh, uh, more and more surgeons are required to change their work very much. Uh, Dr. Bull, may I ask you a question, please? Uh, so we've had another question here about um, training your workforce. So as an intensivist, how are you training um, your uh, non-intensive care colleagues uh, and what problems and solutions have you found that work? Well, did I understand correctly? Uh, are you talking about training uh, non-intensivist uh, colleagues, right? Yeah, we are facing, uh, well, at the beginning, we thought uh, we didn't really need to do that, but we are realizing that in the last days that probably uh, some, some part of our work uh, will be done by non-intensivists uh, in the near future. What we have already done is uh, that the, the oldest uh, residents uh, have been hired by the hospital to, to do some of the uh, lower complexity, uh, critically related uh, procedures. And uh, they provide, for example, assistance to patients receiving non-invasive ventilation, for instance. But it's just uh, news from the last days. Uh, for example, our emergency doctors, which in Italy are, are not uh, uh, intensivists or uh, anesthesiologists, but they are they are they are a separate uh, specialty. They are uh, doing specific trainings uh, for intubation and mechanical ventilation. And I've received uh, personally uh, requests uh, also from the cardiology de department and the internal medicine department uh, to arrange some kind of uh, uh, basic uh, course of uh, mechanical ventilation for doctors because we all perceive that in the next future. Uh, there might be the need for uh, reallocating resources in this sense. How are you delivering that training? Are you delivering it um, in a traditional sense or are you doing, are you using simulation? And also, are you creating any content which we can distribute and share? 
We are not yet creating content, but probably doing so in the next future. Uh, the, um, the emergency room doctors are training uh, in simulation, but uh, training in person is becoming more and more difficult. So uh, probably we will have to uh, allocate the resources uh, uh, based on their practical skills, because acquiring practical skills it's almost impossible uh, through a webinar, for example. So possibly we can forecast uh, a future in which uh, the intensivist uh, will intubate uh, and then the internal doctor uh, will adjust uh, mechanical ventilation parameters, which might be uh, a, a more feasible scenario. If is listening, is interested in the creation of content, please contact us because we're trying to do that and to distribute it. Um, Dr. Ball, I might just ask you two further questions, I hope. Um, so the second question comes on um, ventilating patients. Have you any experience of ventilating more than one patient per machine? And do you have a view on this? Well, I've seen the, the question on the chat. I'm quite surprised because there's a lot of discussion around this. It's, it's published uh, on the media that it's kind of a recent invention. It's not an invention, it's something we know since uh, almost a decade and, uh, um, and it also uh, in in mass casualty scenarios it, all, it, uh, it has already been used but we cannot uh, uh, think uh, about uh, uh, splitting ventilators as the solution because uh, a ventilator doesn't make uh, an ICU. Uh, the risk uh, is that if we still increase the number of beds, multiplying ventilators, uh, there, there will be no doctor skilled enough to treat uh, the patient. And this is the real challenge because we are somehow forced uh, to make uh, triage because uh, if we continue increasing ICU beds, uh, we will decrease dramatically the, the quality of care. So we risk, uh, since the mortality rate of uh, critically ill patients with COVID is extremely high, there's a paper just published on JAMA with a preliminary report of mortality of intubated patients in the US, not in China, in the US, the mortality is around 90%. So this is shocking for us. And so, if we have some chance of uh, uh, treating patients, uh, we have to somehow concentrate our, our knowledge and our experience uh, in selected patients. Because if we continue intubating everybody and just giving them uh, low quality care, I don't expect uh, that we will see any improvement. Sobering. When I when I hear you say this, we we often, of course, we often think about how to improve outcomes, and we. We look at Italy very closely because our experience seems to be matching yours very closely. Do you have a sense of why the mortality rate in Italy is higher than we have seen elsewhere? I'm not an epidemiologist, so I'm not the right person to ask this question, but I have the personal feeling that uh, the under uh, estimation of mild cases which is uh, a forced consequence uh, of the inability of testing all the people we would like to test is a major contributor to to the high mortality rate we've seen in italy uh, a problem that we are seeing here as well uh, in in the uk could we please sorry yes someone was going to say something dr mangini would you be able to ask a, a, a come back in so um do you i have a question here from the audience is there a plan to move urgent or emergency cardiac surgeries to a non-covid hospital uh, oh. and and so this is from a surgeon in london where i work in london all cardiothoracic surgery has been moved to two centers in london in london to free exactly. units to support the covid patients this is exactly what we did already here we yeah. are from uh, 21 uh, division, now there is only four division open in all region of Lombardia and Milan as well. Uh, yeah. So we, uh, I'm, I work here in Ospedale Sacco, in Luigi Sacco Hospital, but I'm performing pro urgent procedure in another hospital. That other hospital is the one kept free from uh, uh, the virus, or we try to keep it yeah. free, free from the virus. So, so, this was, uh, so yes, the quite... idea is to split the, the keep. Every cardiac surgery division has to split the keep 
four consultants are kept for uh, uh, urgent procedure in another hospital, and all the other cardiac surgeons has to go in the uh, to work in the um, uh, COVID wards. So, as the, our co uh, our colleague uh, told you before. We have to uh, change completely our mentality because there are orthopedics uh, trying to manage uh, uh, CPAP patients, uh, um, oculists working in the emergency ward. So we, we are not enough to follow everything. So we are trying to, to organize us in the best way as possible. And can you give me a... Um... Um, we have had a question here from um, Martin in Bahrain. This is a technical question, so forgive me. It says, uh, we are familiar with VASCON 1 to 5 classification uh, for vascular surgery cases. Are there any objective criteria to jumping from one to the other? I don't know. Okay, fair enough. I really don't know. That's fine. Uh, we'll it's, move on. Uh, it's extremely difficult to, to try to standardize everything yeah uh, the only things that uh, you really it's really it's really urgent is to to free as much bed as possible so mm -hmm. my advice is really uh, stop operating normal patient elective patients and uh, uh, try to rearrange your hospital reallocate uh, all the resources you have to be ready for the the peak of the curve and the question i suppose is when do you expect the peak to be well, extremely difficult. Well, we start our maneuvers, our political maneuvers to reduce uh, mobility for the people around 15 days ago. Yeah. So um, from this point of view, next weekend uh, has to be the, the cutoff or uh, this kind of organization uh, works or not. We, we still don't know, um, but we have to wait some more days to understand uh, if it works. OK we are on the right way. If it doesn't work, it would be really a big, big, big problem. From the other point of view, if you just, uh, I, I worked a couple of years in China, so I know I know very well uh, my Chinese co colleague. Um, and the curve of uh, the Chinese um, uh, con uh, patients uh, with COVID positive are, is still different from the one in Europe. So yeah. probably from uh, this point of view, we are around 30 days behind them. Uh, and this is unfortunately because probably we, our uh, peak will be in 20 days from now, not only a couple of days to reach the 15 days from the, the, um, uh, the, all the, the, the maneuvers that we did to stop the people at home and not to move closing the office, closing all the restaurants, closing everything. Uh, the problem is that from the other point of view, from the other side, that in Italy, uh, till last week, a lot of people want to get out, to run, uh, to, to move open air, but which is the problem? I'm just going out on my own, alone, I can run, which is the problem? Yeah. The problem is very simple. If, yeah. uh, if your neighbor uh, see you running, say, well, if he's, he can run, why I can't go out just for a walk? And this is a, a multiplication of people getting out uh, and this could lead to major problem. We're, this is a major problem here for us at the moment. Uh, and we have to, I think, change our strategy on that. Uh, just on this issue, um, Dr. Bull, could I ask you, um, you had, can, uh, this is sort of a, a loaded question because I know that you've brought some images to show. Uh, and could you be kind enough to explain to us part of the problem um, with asymptomatic patients and, and how they present? Yeah, we, our interest uh, towards uh, CT scan is uh, increasing uh, because, uh, as our colleagues uh, from Milan already said, uh, it seems to be even uh, maybe more sensitive compared to the, at least to the nasal swab. Uh, I'm lucky, I mean, I, I work in a, in a COVID only area, so I always have my personal protective uh, equipment, uh, which is uh, something that uh, they are just starting to implement in the regular wards. Uh, but for weeks, my colleagues in the internal medicine wards and in the surgical wards uh, uh, didn't have uh, 
uh, enough masks uh, for protecting all the, the personnel because uh, we thought that the cases uh, would have been uh, much less. And also we are uh, revising retrospectively CT scans of severe pneumonia cases that we had in our ICU in the days and weeks before we started to test uh, COVID. And uh, we are thinking that some of the unexplained uh, CT findings that we found in the last weeks might have been correlated to COVID. Uh, I will just uh, show you the images that were recently published uh, on radiology, uh, just to sh share with you some of the typical CT findings. Uh, I will try to share my screen. We've we've noticed we've had a similar a similar issue with lots of COVID negative allegedly COVID negative patients arriving. Can you see this uh, image? We can, yes. Yeah, I, I will share with you the the title of the of the paper, said so that you can maybe download it. I think it's uh, free of charge, and uh, I would say that this ground glass opacity uh, in proximity with the pleura is quite a, a common finding, and uh, I wanted to show you. Uh, something which is uh, very surprising for me and might uh, involve uh, all of you because look at this image and look at, at the caption uh, this is the ct scan of a 73 year old asymptomatic woman so this patient had no dyspnea and no symptom no fever no cough nothing so this is the kind of patient you could find unexpectedly inside your surgical ward and that's the kind of patient you must be more uh, afraid of because this is the patient that might contaminate uh, your clean operating room and uh, the patient that also could pose uh, a risk for uh, for nurses and doctors the message we are receiving is that is beware of the COVID negative ward. This is where the most danger lies. Exactly. Thank you. Professor Danelli, may I ask you a question, please? Sure. Thank you very much. I'm sorry to chop and change, but it's a service organization question. Uh, this is from, Pre from uh, Professor Aralampalam in Colchester. Um, I think <clears throat> He asked, should we be organizing ourselves into hubs, rethinking ourselves as regions to pull hospital resources? So I know that you have a local hospital hub and spoke in Milan, but should we be doing this across uh, the United Kingdom more broadly? Organization of the whole system in hub and spoke, generally in all Inghilterra. Yeah. Non è, non è facile rispondere perché a Milano e in Lombardia è stato relativamente facile eh, visto che eh, c'è un coordinamento regionale, un'unità di crisi, ma questo occorre farlo a livello politico oltre che sanitario. Uh, well, it's not uh, um, a very simple question to answer uh, because um, the, um, the organization of the um, of, uh, health uh, is different um, from England, I think. Um, in Italy, it was it is it was possible to uh, organize the um, hospital uh, as hubs, um, thanks to the um, Lombardy, uh, which is a regional uh, organization of uh, health, um, which is uh, uh, reorganizing uh, health basing basing uh, based on uh, uh, different hubs. Um, because the region uh, could uh, organize uh, a lot of uh, hospitals. Uh, I don't know. Um, I don't know if uh, in uh, England uh, it, is, it is the same. Uh, well, politics is definitely a problem in England. This much I tell you. But I think what we are finding is, is that um, in, in a time of crisis, people are working together very effectively. And if there was ever going to be a time to achieve this in England, now is it. Um, so, um, I just also had a question, um, um, please, um, Dr. Bull. I understand that you've observed some COVID-related coagulopathy. Uh, could you comment on that and explain um, any uh, important uh, observation? Yeah, this is something I'm very happy of uh, sharing with you. 
Uh, first, uh, because it might influence uh, surgical choices, because of course approaching a patient with uh, coagulopathy uh, poses challenges for the surgeon, but also as a general parameter, we are starting to look more and more, I have no answer so far, but mm, please consider looking at coagulation very cautiously. Uh, we are observing that uh, patients that develop uh, severe forms of respiratory failure are much, much more prone to have uh, uh, some kind of uh, coagulation dysfunction. Uh, I suggest you to look at the D-dimer, uh, which is a simple way to assess coagulation, a very a specific uh, test, but we are looking at it uh, with the more and more interest because uh, we uh, are discovering a lot of pulmonary embolism in our patients. I would say that at least in young patients, uh, uh, a relevant uh, uh, proportion of them die not because uh, of uh, insufficient ventilation of, of ventilation of the lungs, but because of an impairment of the uh, ventilation perfusion matching. Uh, in more than uh, five patients, we performed uh, CT scans uh, for uh, different uh, indications, chest uh, CT scans, I mean, with contrast medium. Uh, on five patients, only in one case, the, the clinical suspect was pulmonary embolism. And uh, in the other four patients, uh, we invariably found some kind of uh, uh, perfusion alteration from small emboli to uh, major obstruction of uh, pulmonary vessels. Uh, I would suggest to test uh, D-dimer and uh, coagulation in any patient uh, uh, with uh, COVID and uh, respiratory failure. And I would suggest also to start very early uh, prophylaxis uh, with heparin. I have no, we are making several attempts uh, with uh, uh, low molecular weight heparin, uh, sodium heparin infusion and several attempts. I would like to share with you another picture which is a, a thromboelastogram of one of our patients in which we incidentally found a, a very high D and uh, sorry the image quality is very low for those of you that are familiar with the thromboelastogram this is uh, shocking this is uh, a very premature formation of the clot uh, a very rapid formation of the clot uh, and a very strong uh, uh, clot forming in, in the patient uh, uh, blood vessels. So uh, I have no definitive data on that. We are also trying to make some kind of research in the field. Even if making research in this setting is a real challenge, of course, we have in the midst of uh, an emergency. But if I can tell you something, please spare some uh, of your energies uh, to think because uh, the human beings uh, have faced uh, several times in history um, uh, epidemics and, uh, and we have fought uh, several diseases and uh, usually we managed uh, to handle them uh, thinking and not only acting. So spare some of your energies uh, to reflect uh, on what you're doing. You know, that, that's the whole point of this webinar and also for PanSurge. So we have some trials trying to answer some of those questions, particularly PanSurge predict, and we will, and D-dimer is included in that. And um, we really need the community now to work together to help solve some of those questions. Um, I suppose in the, just the, some people are asking questions about uh, the paper that Dr. Bull demonstrated and also the talk that will, we will make that available to you after the, after the talk. We'll put that up on the website. Uh, and we will also make this video available so you can come back and listen to it uh, when you need to. Um, so um, it's it, the question that we've just had come in, which says the CT chest of the asymptomatic patient you demonstrated was very striking. It raises the question about whether we should be screening our asymptomatic staff for active COVID infection more regularly. What are your views on this? Perhaps I could ask um, Professor uh, uh, Danelli, uh, please, your view on that. Should we be screening our staff? Dovremmo, però attualmente non è possibile. Eh, vorrei anche fare una precisazione che dopo traduce il mio collaboratore sugli studenti e sugli specializzandi. 
gli studenti fanno solo i e learning attualmente, ma gli specializzanti lavorano con noi in reparto. Um, Professor Donnelly thinks that uh, we um, um, test uh, all personal um, staff. Um, we should, yes. Uh, but uh, now uh, only uh, symptomatic staff is uh, test. And uh, another consideration uh, Professor Donnelly want to, wants to, um, to do is that, um, that uh, students are not allowed to uh, attend the department. Um, they are uh, only um, attending e-learning. Uh, and uh, um, on the other side, uh, residents, um, surgical residents are um, uh, available uh, to, uh, to, give, um, to give help. And so I'm going to ask it again, just because I'm interested in, in Professor Danelli's opinion. Uh, wh what is your local practice for managing patients with acute appendicitis? Uh, are, you, uh, are you using CT scans to diagnose them and are you treating them with antibiotics? Uh, utilizziamo uh, la TAC, uh, antibiotici e se c'è una raccolta intervento in laparoscopia. Okay. Um, we uh, perform CT scan um, and uh, uh, we, um, we give antibiotics, uh, but if uh, we uh, find uh, um, abscess or preparation, uh, we uh, intervene with surgical operation. Okay. Um, we we have uh, just four minutes uh, and before we are, are due to finish and so i want to ask the same question to each of our speakers uh, and we will finish this every after every session so perhaps um we could start with uh, dr mangini uh if you if you knew um then what you know now what advice would you give yourself well no the only thing is the very first is the, the the more simple at all is stay at home. Don't yeah. get out okay. and stay at home. This is not in the in the hospital, but just in the normal life. In normal and try to it's convince okay. all the all your patients, all your colleagues, all your friends, mm -hmm. all your families to do the same. Uh, from the medical point of view, uh, uh, start to wear the mask as soon as possible, mm -hmm. uh, because mm -hmm. this is really really important. This is our norm. The, uh, the, um, uh, the complete uh, mask, but if everyone could wear this, uh, so I'm, this is not protecting me, my protecting the others, so uh, avoiding the spreading of the virus. Um, and this is absolutely very, very important. But of course, you say, well, if I am in the world, yes, I can wear it. In my office with my colleague, why? It's not, it's a stupid stuff. It's not stupid at all. So uh, this is my very first advice. Uh, the second one, I just want to underline the, the problem of the, of the test for the COVID. Uh, of course, uh, in, the, in the perfect world, uh, we, all of us, have to be uh, um, uh, tested for that. But then, you know, we work in the hospital, we, uh, then we go home, we go to, the, to, to buy food. Uh, so, um, I, I think to be sure I am not infected, I have to be uh, to perform the test every day. And this, of course, could be impossible. So um, in the patient is different because the normal uh, urgent patient, I mean, uh, they can wait at least eight hours, uh, can, be, uh, can be tested. But uh, try to imagine out in the section which you have to uh, to to operate as soon as possible in 15 minutes, 20 minutes, one hour at least, it's not possible to have the test uh, before the procedure. You you can you do the test, you do the, you perform the procedure, and then you have to wait. And uh, of course, you hope that uh, will be negative, but you don't know. In this case, if we don't have the test uh, in the OR, we are totally dressed with. Uh, the FP, uh, FPP3 uh, mask uh, as the patient, uh, uh, as the, we know that the patient is already infected. So at uh, 60 minutes, I'm afraid we're going to have to finish. Um, I have to 
most respectfully thank uh, our speakers. We are just so grateful for your expertise and your time. We know that you're very busy. The lessons that you have uh, given us today are, are utterly essential. Um, I think just to summarize, for me, my take home message is that strategically, we really need to be moving to a hub and spoke model very quickly. This is clearly happening in some centers across the United Kingdom and we need to happen more widely. We now really need to think quite carefully about fundamentals, so oxygen supplies, for example, and we shouldn't, um, we shouldn't not uh, miss, uh, understand the importance of training our people who are gonna have to upskill and we need to be able to do that at scale and we need to do that uh, with a high quality um, uh, educational um, program. We need to think quite carefully about guidelines, particularly for measuring uh, for, for the performance of our um, staff who have to manage elective disease, but also acute surgical disease. And most importantly, we need to protect our people and we need to change our strategy around how we do that, both with testing, but also how we approach PPE and perhaps this needs to be more global. And finally, research, which brings me on to our final few slides. So uh, we are, Pansurge is, is here. It is a global thing. It is for you, not for us. So we are here to help and support you. If you have questions, please ask us. I'm, I don't know if you're like me, but if you're like me, I have a WhatsApp link. And at the moment, I'm getting about 500 WhatsApps a day. Uh, and on that WhatsApp is lots of very insightful commentary and thought and analysis by my peers on papers and science and practice. We need to get that off WhatsApp now, and it needs to come into a platform where it's transparent and we can share the insight of the community. We have a forum on PanSurge, and it would be just amazing if you could start using it because then we can capture that insight and we can use it. Uh, we have two trials that have launched. Uh, the PanSurge Safe uh, trial is really looking at the safety culture and the psychological impact and burnout of the medical workforce as it progresses. And then PanSurge Predict, which is really looking to predict real-time risk stratification models, which comes back uh, down to the commentary we've had today in, uh, in the session. So we need to do that in real time now. Uh, you heard Dr. Ball talk about the importance of D-dimer. We have to learn these things collectively on the hoof now. So if you can support that, that would be great. And of course, I'm sure you will all be aware of COVID surge, which is uh, the globalsurge.org's trial uh, being run out of Birmingham. We also recommend wholeheartedly to submit data to this as part of your practice. Um, we are a collaborative. So again, please contact us. We will make the papers available from today. We will also make any other um, um, uh, content available today. And you can register and support the project here through the, uh, our REDCap initiative at the link below. Uh, once again, um, I just want to uh, thank our speakers. I wish you um, uh, all um, your help and I hope you stay safe uh, and thank you again. We have two further webinars this week. This one is on Friday. It will be coming from Singapore uh, and we will be getting the Singaporean perspective. And we also very much hope to have uh, a webinar on Wednesday hosted by um, uh, Shanu Rashid uh, and to try and give a more UK experience and, and in particular to think about how we could execute the hub and spoke model uh, and operationalize some of these things that we've discussed today. Please stay safe, look after yourself, and thank you again to our speakers. We are very, very grateful. Thank you.